part two to the question and answers. I've already got enough questions probably for tonight and next Wednesday tonight. So uh, keep on bringing them in because this, uh, this is, I enjoy it. Uh, it seems to be <clears throat> what people like, what they want to hear. So uh, as long as that's working for you, then uh, that's what we'll do. Uh, tonight, we're going to deal with, all of these are going to be on there on Facebook. We're live streaming right now, uh, Facebook and on YouTube. And I'm going home and dividing these up into questions. So, and, it's, and if you're searching for a certain question, you're not going to have to watch the whole video of last week. I've divided it up, uh, or in the process of doing that, I think I got three questions uh, cut down to a certain uh, that certain question. So if you're looking for that one, then you can just go to that one video that you're interested in. So uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, tonight, let's look at uh, question number five. So I think it's Ronnie that asked this. We want to know about dinosaurs and cavemen. And uh, so that's always a common question. Uh, people want to know about what dinosaurs, where they come from. Here's what I want you to remember. Everything they told you in school, if it started out something like this, six million years ago, automatically, you cut it off, close the book, get up, go to the lunchroom. Uh, <clears throat> that's, that's as far from the Bible as anybody knows. You say, Brother Jeremy, how do you know? Well, they say they look at a tree that's this big around, and they look at all the rings on the inside of that tree after they cut it. And they say, well, one ring is, a, is equals uh, 500,000 years. So this thing has got um, uh, six rings, and so it, six rings, and then each ring is 500,000 years. It's, it just adds up to, okay, think about this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And he created everything in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. How do you know God didn't create that tree that big around? It took him five minutes to do it. He took Adam. He formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, breathed his nostrils, the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Adam was a full-grown man. Adam never was a baby. Adam never was a baby, never had a mama, never had a daddy. He was, he was made a full-grown man. So if you walked up to Adam five minutes after he was created, you would say, boy, what, how old are you? You're 33, 40? How old are you? So I'm five minutes old. <laughs> well, you looked 40. Well, I don't know how I look, but I just got here five minutes ago. God could create it to look like it's been here longer than what it is. Now, which brings me to dinosaurs. When you go to, um, you know, some of these uh, museums, and I like to do it. Matter of fact, you go to, what is it, one in Union City, Discovery Park. You go in there, and they got this big, humongous uh, creature. And 80% uh, of that creature is plaster of Paris, Iron, uh, uh, chicken wire with three bones. So they took three bones and they orchestrated this big monstrosity and made you believe. See how they do that? I mean, if that was a real deal, why ain't it all bones? Why couldn't some of those bones be human bones? You say humans wasn't that big back before the flood. How do you know? The Bible says there were giants in those days. Goliath was nine foot tall. I bet you his bones are bigger than yours. Now, um, all right, let's think about this. In the Bible, you will not find the word dinosaur in the Bible. The reason you won't find the word dinosaur in the Bible is because the word dinosaur shows up in 1841 to describe the fossils of extinct reptiles. And so the Bible, actually 1611, so in 1611 they didn't have the word dinosaur to insert in the Bible. And so in the Bible the word is dragon. Now, when you go and look, dragon is used 18 times in the Bible. 
dragons with an S is used 16 times in the Bible. Now, you say, Brother Jeremy, are there any dinosaurs in the Bible? Well, um, in Job 41, in verse 1, there is a creature over there called Leviathan. You'll have to read the whole chapter. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I put one verse. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Obviously, if you're fishing for, he's a, he's a sea creature. Uh, and his tongue with a cord and so on and so forth. If you read Job 41, um, verse 19, out of his mouth goeth burning lamps and sparks of fire leaps out. Uh, out of his nostrils groweth smoke. His breath kindleth coals. Flame goeth out of his mouth, so on and so forth. Uh, you read all about Job 41, about Leviathan. Now, you say, smoke, fire coming out of his mouth, all that kind of stuff. Now, Leviathan is a picture and a type of the devil. You'll find him in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, you say, a great dragon. Has seven heads, ten horns. A big creature. And uh, so there's another one. It's called Behemoth. It's in chapter 40. And in chapter 40, behold, now behemoth, which I've made with thee. He is grass as an ox, and so on and so forth. His strength is in his loins. Uh, now, verse 17, you say, how do you know this could be, could be a dinosaur? In Job's day, Job, after the flood, Job, uh, they say, Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Um, and so he moveth his tail like a cedar. A pretty big creature. His bones, strong pieces of brass. These possibly could have been dinosaurs in, in Job's uh, day. Now, you say, well, why don't we have dinosaurs today? Well, I'll tell you why. Before the flood, let's just say that the flood <clears throat> is right here. So, before the flood, you got Adam. Adam lived to be 930 years old. Before he died, Adam lived 930 years. You say, how did a person live before the flood? How does a person live 930 years? Well, before the flood, the atmosphere that we have now was not like it was before the flood. Before the flood, it was a water canopy over this universe, which created a greenhouse effect. And things lived longer. Things lasted longer. People lived longer. Uh, Methuselah was the oldest man in the Bible, 969 years, almost 1,000 years, 969 years. Then, after the flood, after the flood, Noah, he lived 630. So everybody after Noah, that thing starts tapering down. You know, see what I'm saying? After the flood, the water canopy, a lot of the water that flooded the earth is now in our oceans used to be overhead. I ain't got time to tell you about all that now, but yeah, it's there. It's called the water canopy. It's almost like in the Garden of Eden, it was like a greenhouse. That's why stuff uh, produced like it did. That's why Adam lived long as he did. But after the flood, now in 2024, what's the life expectancy? 80, 20, 120, okay. So now we've went from 930 to 120 years. Now, think about this. Dinosaurs, dragons, as the Bible calls, are reptiles. Okay? A reptile is the only animal that never stops growing. A reptile will never stop growing. They grow and they grow and they grow. Us, we get to a certain point, we quit, we quit growing. Matter of fact, the older you get, you start shrinking. <laughs> and, uh, but a, a reptile, a reptile doesn't stop growing. It doesn't have a stopping spot for growth. Now, you take an iguana and you put him before the flood and you make him live or let him live 930 years, what do you got? A oh, big old iguana. <laughs> you take uh, some of these other reptile animals, um, all those things, and you let them live a thousand years before the flood. What do you got? You say, okay, why don't we have them now? 
120 years, life expectancy, they don't live long enough to grow that big anymore. The Bible, science hasn't caught up with the Bible. The Bible is the final authority of everything. And scientists would come in here and boy, they would pull their hair out. They would pull, they would start clipping their nails, just pulling their nails out if they heard what I just said. Because they deny in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. They believe in evolution. And we are, are we evolving. And we're evolving and we are evolving. We're involved. We're getting better and better. We started out as a tadpole. And then we turn into a frog, and then, you know, this, and then, and, 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 and then we got the apes and the monkeys and the whatever, and now we're human beings. People, that ain't even good baloney to be chewing on. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Uh, and the Neanderthal man, where, where is he? Where is he at today? You know, <laughs> who knows? So anyway, dinosaurs. So you believe the Bible for all matters of faith and practice before you do any scientists. Well, we got proof. Well, where's your proof? Well, down in here, we've got these, uh, these, these layers of dirt. And these layers of dirt right here. Each, see them lines and the layers of dirt? Each one of those lines represents so many thousands and thousands of years. How do you know the flood didn't cause the layers as the water depleted off the earth? It caused layers. Now, the second part of that question is, uh, what about cavemen? Where did cavemen come from? Are cavemen, do they really exist? Well, uh, they actually do. Now, what you're thinking is, you know, some caveman, he's got a billy club, and he's pulling his, you know, his wife <laughs> by the hair of the head, you know, <laughs> and she gets over, and she goes in there and cooks him supper or whatever, you know. <clears throat> That's television. We're not talking about, we're not tel tel talking about television, we're talking about the Bible. Now, when Adam and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, they got kicked out of, now the Garden of Eden was a perfect environment. But when they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden for because of sin, they didn't go and call Roger to build them a two-story house. Where do you think they tried to go and find shelter at? You said, Brother Jeremy, you got any Bible for that? Yes, I did my homework. Genesis 19 and verse 30. And Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zor. And he dwelt in a... He and his two daughters. Where did he live? Lived in a cave. What was Lot for a while? He's a caveman. 1 Samuel 22, verse 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dulam. And when his brethren and his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Where did he go? He escaped to a cave. Uh, that's where he was at. 1 Kings 19, in verse number 9. Elijah, he came thither unto a cave and did what there? Lodged there. He lived there. In the Bible. Not, I didn't pull all the verses. I didn't pull all the verses. But in the Bible, they buried people in caves. Abraham's wife, Sarah, they buried her in a cave. A lot of people were buried. A lot of people lived in caves. All these different things, and people say, well, cavemen. Well, this is where they come from. They actually lived there. That was a shelter uh, for them. And, and so, anyway, that's uh, all through the Bible. Just take a search on your Bible. Blue Letter Bible is what I use, and just type in cave, and you'll find all these people. Where the, matter of fact, uh, Saul, David and Saul, they were at each other, and Saul uh, uh, cornered up in a cave, took all of his men, and that's where they stayed. That's where they lived for a little while. That's just what they did in Bible times until they got dwelling places like what we have today. So that's the answer to that. Any question, comment on that before I move to the second one? Um, now, here's, a, here's another question that was brought to my attention. 
Matter of fact, it was Miss Juanita that brought this uh, question to me. What is purgatory? Well, purgatory is a word that you will not find in the Bible. You won't find purgatory in the Bible anywhere. Purgatory comes from a group of books called the Apocrypha books. The Apocrypha books are what they call the Catholic editions. Uh, these books are um, they're not inspired writings. Um, they're not a part of the 66 books of the canon of Scripture. A lot of Bible, the Catholic Bible, if you had a copy of the Catholic Bible, they would have throughout the Old Testament. They would have sprinkled in that uh, the book of Tobit, the book of Judith, uh, the Ecclesiasticus, uh, the book of Baruch, all of these, the, the Maccabees, first and second Maccabees. You say, I've never heard of these books. They are the, what they call the apocryphal books. The idea of purgatory is found in those books. These are Catholic writings. And so purgatory, say, so, well, what is it? Well, uh, in the Catholic line of doctrine, they say, well, you, if a person dies, a family member dies, they go to a purgatory, a holding place. They don't go to heaven. They don't go to hell. They go to a uh, purgatory. And they were the halfway, I guess. And if you're a family, that's why you go do penance. You come down and you, and you pay the church real good. If you pay real good and, and you pray real good, then it's like your, your, your loved one is right here in purgatory. They can go down or up. And so they're in purgatory. So if you pray them out, you ever heard people praying people out of hell? You pray them out. And boy, here they come. They go up, they go to heaven. But now if your family ain't praying, elevator all the way down. Now, some of you are laughing, and you should, because it's the dumbest thing you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> That's why it's not found in the Bible. Uh, it's found in... Now, let me give you something else you might not know. These apocryphal books, do y'all remember um, the Passion of the Christ? The Passion of Christ, Mel Gibson. Mel Gip Gibson was a Roman Catholic. There were a lot of things that happened in the Passion of the Christ movie that's not found in the Bible. They are found in the apocryphal books. A lot of the stuff that happened. I, I can't... Uh, there was one scene about a little dove. Jesus had this little dove or something. And uh, that's found in the Apocrypha books. Now, you say, well, what's wrong with reading extra? There's nothing wrong with reading. Matter of fact, you can read some of those pretty good stories in there. But you have to remember, there's inspired writing, inspired by God. Or you can read Macbeth, Moby Dick. There's nothing, I mean, you can read Shakespeare. Just be, just be like reading one of the Apocrypha books. They're history books. You might find something in there interesting. But do not read those and say, this is the Word of God. It's not. What we have before us is the Word of God. Somebody asked me about the book of Enoch. There's nothing wrong with reading the book of Enoch. It's just not a part of the canon of Scripture. There's 66 books that completed the canon of Scripture. And uh, there's other books. There's a bunch. Did y'all know that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote more than 13 books of the Bible? But only 13 of his books were inspired writing and made the canon of Scripture. Romans through Philemon. He wrote other books. You say, well, why can't we read those? You can. But you can't read those and say, thus saith the Lord. But you can in Romans, you can in Philemon, you can in Corinthians, you, you see. So there's nothing wrong with reading all this other stuff. You'll find a lot of interesting information, you know. But then you can't say, after you read something in here that's not in the Bible, and you say, well, well I'm telling you, I, man, this right here, thus say the Lord, this, is in the, this had to happen. You don't know if it did or not. And one thing that really gets, gets me, gets me really good. Now, look. I posted this one time, and you talking about getting crucified. <laughs> I made a post about watching The Chosen or watching The Passion of the Christ or watching. Y'all remember when that movie come out, Noah? And they had all them giants up there helping Noah build the ark and, uh, and uh, rock creatures. They were rock creatures. And uh, they were stumbling around helping him build the ark. We went to see it. I enjoyed it. It was entertainment. 
But most of that stuff wasn't in the Bible. My problem with folks, they read The Chosen, and they watch, oh, I watch The Chosen. I'm a Christian. (laughs) Oh, I know the Bible. I watch The Chosen. No, you don't. Because there's a lot of stuff that goes on in The Chosen. It's not in the Bible. It's extra Stuff they put in there to help you get stay entertained and watch the stuff. But I've heard I've had people call me and say, "Well, I didn't know such and such happened. It was on the chosen." I said, "Laying in the Bible." <laughs> they watch television as their Bible study. Well, I saw Charleston Heston and the Ten Commandments. Boy, that was good. That was. I've watched it a hundred times. But can I tell you one thing? It's not in. That's not in the Bible that happened in the Ten Commandments. Y'all remember when uh, they crossed the Red Sea? And Pharaoh, Pharaoh's up on the mountain. He's up there looking. And all his whole army gets, psh, the water. Gets, and did y'all know, according to the Bible, Pharaoh died that day in the Red Sea? But not in the Ten Commandments movie. He didn't. He's still alive. The Bible is always the, is the, the final authority. For all matters of faith and practice. Christian movies, wonderful. Love to watch them. But the Bible comes first. And you see something on the movie, and it don't line up with this, we throw the movie out, and we stay with the Bible. So, purgatory, that's where that comes from. And um, anyway, all right. So, let me ask you this. Did Adam and Eve go to hell for bringing sin into the world? Now, this is um, something very interesting, and I'll show you. Uh, Adam and Eve did, matter of fact, Eve ate of the fruit. She turned, gave to her husband with her, and they both eat of the fruit, which God told them not to eat of it. He said, the day you eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And so would, would Adam and Eve be going to hell because they had first people that brought sin into the world? Well, let's find out what happened. And when the woman, verse 6, saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse 7, and the eyes of them both were opened, that, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Okay? So what they did, they found out, so, oh, I'm naked. We talked about this last week, about when a child comes to the uh, knowledge of right and wrong, comes to the knowledge of uh, the, the truth, and so on and so forth. And so Adam and Eve, right then, they ate of the tree of knowledge, good and evil. So when they ate of that, they knew they were enlightened. Their eyes were open to things that they weren't open to before. And now they look and they thought, it, there wasn't a problem being naked yesterday, but today there was because they disobeyed God. So they sewed fig leaves together and tried to cover themselves. You ever see a kid get caught with a hand in a cookie jar? He got a cookie and he does this. Everybody wants to hide. Uh, the first time you took a drink, young people, uh, I know there's you know, all the young people over there, but us adults, first time that maybe you ever uh, took a drink of something you wasn't supposed to, uh, or maybe you smoked something you wasn't supposed to smoke. Let me ask you something. Did y'all do it at the kitchen table with mom and dad there? Or did you go out behind the barn and do it? Hiding. Ain't that something? The Bible's an amazing book. It's what God did for them. There's a lot of scripture that I left out. Uh, But it's what God did, did for them. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins. And clothe them. Now what God did. He came down in the Garden of Eden. Took off what they had. Their, their works. God took off their works. And God apparently kills two lambs. And made blood was shed. And made coats of skin. And clothed them. With the bloodshed garment. That's the same thing that happened to you. When Jesus Christ died on the cross. Before I got saved, I'm trying to work. Trying to work. Fig leaves, I'm trying to cover. A fig leaf falls off. i got to do something else to cover. And it will never stay. I'm always trying to do something to cover. Cover. 
But then, behold, the Lamb of God, it taketh away the sin of the world. So basically what God did, same thing he did in the Garden of Eden. He come down, killed a lamb to cover them. So you say, did they go to hell? No, they went to heaven. He covered them with the blood of a lamb in, in the book of Genesis. Just like Jesus did for you on the cross. He covered you by the blood of the lamb. Now, what about, <laughs> y'all not ready for this one. <laughs> what about fasting? I've always joked. Every time, you know, I say something, I try to <clears throat> joke about it and say, well, I thought fasting was get to the table as fast as you could. <laughs> Somebody asked about fasting. And uh, a lot of people, when you say fasting, they always relate it to food. And that's the big, that's the big one. But you can fast from anything. The idea of fasting, let me, let me give you some verses before we uh, explain. Daniel 9 in verse 3, Daniel says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Fasting. Uh, another verse, you remember the disciples were trying to uh, cast out these demons. And they couldn't do it. Jesus comes to them, Matthew 17, verse 24. How be it? This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and what? Fasting. God, um, if you want to, okay, pause. If you're just praying about something, sometimes God will answer your prayer without fasting. He'll answer your prayer. There's always there's always three answers to it. People say, does God always answer prayer? He always answers prayer. But you may not like one of the three answers. We always want the yes. But there's always a no. And then there's a wait. So when you're praying, he always answers your prayer. Say, God's not answering my prayer. Yes, he is. It's either yes, no, or wait. And sometimes we'll pray. He ain't answering my prayer. You might be on the waiting list. <laughs> because you're going to get, he's going to get more glory out of by waiting and making you wait. And you continue to pray over whatever you're praying for. Now, if you come to that point and you feel like you're not getting uh, an answer from heaven, this is what happens. Praying to God about spiritual things is a spiritual in the spiritual realm. So if you want to enter in the spiritual realm and be more effective, you got to decrease the physical. <laughs> you can't increase the physical and get into the spiritual. So when you pray like Daniel... Like the Lord was telling the disciples, sometimes you can't get a prayer through. It feels like you're just hitting the wall, hitting the ceiling there. You might want to try fasting. You say, Brother Jeremy, I'll starve. Ah, <laughs> I'm going to look down before I say this. I've looked at some of you. Y'all ain't going to starve. <laughs> I'm not either. But the idea is humbling myself. My fleshly desire. My flesh wants to eat. But I'm saying, God, I'm putting my flesh aside. I'm about to starve to death. But I'm, my flesh is wanting to tell me that I'm hungry. But I'm putting that aside. I'm going to humble myself. And I'm seeking the spiritual. And I'm asking you to answer this prayer. And sometimes, a lot of times, that will get heaven's attention. When you... Here's, here's the, I tell people all the time, I strive, to, I do not like my body in control of me, my flesh. I always tell people, I, I had to, used to, I couldn't pass a Sonic without pulling in and getting a Route 44 sweet tea. Is there anything wrong with a Route 44 sweet tea? No. Well, other than the sugar that they put in it. But every time I pass one, my body says, pull in there and get one. Now, is there anything wrong with it? No. 
But try telling your body, try passing the sonic and telling your body, your body says, oh, I sure would like a sweet tea. And you just say, no, and see how your flesh reacts. So fasting can be more than just food. Fasting is something that's controlling your body. Some of you can't go a day without being on Facebook. And God says, I'm not answering your prayer till you let some of that fleshly stuff go and let me control your body instead of, mm, maybe I should say this for Sunday morning. Some people need a Facebook fast. Just get off of it today. You say, oh, I can quit anytime I want to. Try it. You'll go into, you'll go into uh, uh, conniptions. People, just try to, just try not to, try not to get on it. And you'll be like. <laughs> Your flesh is controlling you. It's telling you what you want to do. And God says, I don't like that. I want to be in control of you. And so until you fast, I'm not answering your prayer until you humble yourself and neglect yourself and put me as the focus. It doesn't always have to be food. It can be. A lot of times it is because that is a fleshly desire to eat. Uh, We have to uh, we have to eat to live, but most people <laughs> live to eat. <laughs> and there's a difference. You're supposed to eat till you get full and don't eat no more. Well, I'm supposed to clean my plate. Well, you shouldn't have piled it up that high. <laughs> it's about the flesh. God wants you to, um, it's about control. I do not like anything controlling my body. Does it sometimes? Yes. You know, some people, can I say this? Mm, I don't know what you do at home. But it may be, it may be soap operas or, I mean, you can't, I remember this as a, and if daddy was here, he'd laugh himself silly when I say this. He told it to be the truth. I get, I mean, I, he told it to be the truth. He never lied to me. He told me. He said on a Wednesday night, we was having a prayer meeting. And he said, lady, Judy, was you there? There we go. We got a witness. <laughs> daddy was having prayer. Is there any prayer requests? And this lady asked prayer for one of the characters on the soap opera <laughs> that was going through whatever. And said, we need to pray for so-and-so because they're, you know, facing this right here. (laughs) My hand up. You two engulfed it. (laughs) You need a fast. (laughs) Could be anything. What's controlling you? What, What would get God's attention if you just laid it down and said, God, I'm putting it down. There's nothing wrong with sweet tea. There's nothing wrong with a Coke and a candy bar. There's nothing wrong with all that stuff. But when it controls your every think, your every move, your mind, your soul, your body, God says, why about giving me some control? And so a lot of times, God answers prayer through fasting because he wants to see you control your own body and tell it no. So I haven't had a, a Sonic Sweet Tea and I don't know, probably five, longer than that. Probably uh, six or seven years. Um, just because, like I said, is there anything wrong? Not, nothing wrong with it. Not a thing wrong with it. Um, but it's about, you know, control. What controls I thought this was supposed to be a good Bible study, but it's starting to be a preaching session right here. (laughs) What control, what is controlling you? What controls you? And you say, I can't get my prayers answered. What's controlling you? I can't get my prayers answered. What what do you need to give up? What do you need to give up? You need to give up something? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, let's find another question. Hallelujah. 
Uh, let's see. What was it? Fasting? Okay. Oh, uh, Jesus. Y'all remember? Let me say this one more thing about fasting because I just saw the note. Fasting, y'all remember when Jesus was tempted of the devil in the wilderness? He fasted 40 days to be able to combat and fight the devil. You say, well, he's God. He shouldn't have had to do it. You have to remember. Yes, he was God, but he was 100% man. It wasn't 50% man, 50% God. Mm -mm. He was 100% man after Mary and 100% God after his heavenly father. And so when he goes into that uh, wilderness temptation, he is facing a physical obstacle. And he's got to fast and neglect himself to get his father's attention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any question or comment about that before I move on to something else? Question, comment? Anything? <clears throat> How far, I don't know who asked me this, and I don't have the verses, but I'll tell you where they're found. Uh, matter of fact, I'll go to them, and I'll tell you where they're found. Somebody asked me, and they may be here tonight. If they are, tell me, because I don't remember who sent me this question, but they wanted to know, in the book of Jude, in the book of Jude, let's see, verse 9, I'm going to read it to you. Yet Michael the archangel... When contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So Michael the archangel is contending, fighting, had an altercation with the devil over the body, the dead body of Moses. This is in Deuteronomy. Um, uh, Moses dies in Deuteronomy 34 and verse 5. Moses dies in 34, Deuteronomy 34 and verse 5. Now, here's what's interesting. He had a private funeral on Mount Nebo. Only God knows where Moses was buried. But somewhere between the day he died, or very shortly... Michael, the archangel, the God, says, Michael, go down there and bring me back the body of Moses. He comes down to this world we live in and uh, gets the body. Well, between here and the third heaven, he runs into Satan. The prince, you say, he lives up there? He's the prince and power of the air. It's called the internet, the radio waves, television it's all in the air. We're coming to you today from the airwaves. That's where he's at. And they had a altercation. And um, what happens is the devil says, hey, basically, this is just me thinking it through. Hey, where are you going with Moses? It ain't time for the resurrection. God has need of it. Dude, uh, Jude. Dude, uh, Jude said, "Durst not bring uh, the, the Lord uh, uh, had need of him, need his body." And so, you know, the devil's like, "Hey, it ain't time for the resurrection. You can't have him. You can't take him out of the grave. It ain't time for the resurrection. God knows that. The devil knows the Bible." And Michael says, well, "That's something you got to just not bring a railing accusation again. You got to take up with the Lord to rebuke you." He told me to come. I'm doing what he told me to do. If you've got a problem with what I'm doing, you take it up with him. Now, you say, why? Why? Uh, why did he need the body of Moses? Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration. Guess who shows up to help the Lord in his greatest time of need? And, and on the Mount of Transfiguration, Mount of Olives, Moses and Elijah appears. Two men that were caught up before their time. Matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter number 12, there's going to be two witnesses. Uh, their names are not mentioned, but in Revelation chapter 12, let me show you. I'm not even going to tell you who the two witnesses are. I'm going to let you tell me. I'll let you tell me. Uh, excuse me, not 12, 11. Uh, Revelation 11, watch this. 
And I will give power unto my two witnesses. That's in verse 3. And they shall prophesy a thousand two, two hundred and threescore days. That's 1260. Clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man hurt them, fire breatheth out of their, com, proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Verse 6, y'all ready? These, these two witnesses, have power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of the prophecy. Who was that? Elijah. And have power over waters to turn them into blood and smite the earth with all plagues as often as he will. Who was that? So I didn't even tell y'all. Y'all told me. Somebody said, who's two witnesses? Well, it's pretty easy to me. <laughs> These two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, the same two that showed up in Matthew 17, will come back in the middle, in the middle. You say, how do you know? 1,200. What does it say? Um, um, 1,000, 200, that's 1,200. Three score, that's 60. 1,260. You know what 1,260 is? Three and a half years. So that Bible tells me Moses and Elijah is going to show up right here and they're going to prophesy for these three and a half years right here. Which tells me again that the first half is how long? Three and a half, seven years. Seven years tribulation. Why did they fight over the body? Well, there you go. That's why. He's trying to keep him uh, from coming back, I guess. I think i got time for one more question. And don't even remember who, who brought this one up. But uh, they wanted to know, are there any creatures chained in the bottom of the Euphrates River? Well, the Bible says in Revelation 9 and verse 14 through 16, uh, this is about middle ways in tribulation. Saying to the sixth angel which had, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So there are angels right now bound in the bottom of the Euphrates River. Now if you look at the Euphrates River, uh, let me read. Let me read. Uh, the four angels, and the four angels were loose. So those creatures that are, or those angels that are chained, bottom of Euphrates River, middle tribulation, and the four angels were loosed. They'll be loosed halfway, uh, which were prepared for an hour, a day, and a month, a year, for to slay a third part of men. That's what they're going to do. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand. You know how long, I mean, that is 200 million. And I heard the number of them. That's a bunch that are following these four angels. You say, now how did they get put under there? Well, if these are the same ones, you have to go back to the book of Jude and verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Y'all see that? There were angels that disobeyed. When, when, Lu when Lucifer, Satan, the devil, he was second in command. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. Boy, I just thought of something y'all might like. The throne, around the throne. Revelation chapter 4, there's uh, four creatures. An eagle. An ox, a lion, and the face of a man. That's the human race. You got the eagle, king of the air, the ox, land, and what, what was it? Um, the what? The lion. the lion. Is the lion what? The lion king. The reptile is missing. The reptile representation is missing. Lucifer, the dragon, 
got kicked out of heaven, disobeying God. He took a third of the angels with him when he left. And so now uh, there's one, you know, the reptile uh, is missing. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. Maybe you didn't. Um, but then there, there's something that happened in Genesis chapter 6. So the sons of men coming to the, uh, excuse me, the sons of God coming to the daughters of men and, uh, and, and made themselves wives. And then there were giants in the, in the land of those days. It's Genesis 6. I'm not sure what all happened. I could tell you, but you wouldn't come back. Um, and because you would think I wasn't in the Bible. And of course, you think unless it shows up on the Discovery Channel or on your favorite show, it won't, it won't never happen. But there's a lot of stuff that happened in that Bible uh, that <laughs> you should be surprised. Um, but the angels that kept not their first estate left their uh, habitation reserved, everlasting change, under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. You say, where's the Euphrates River? Do y'all know this whole, and we're going to close right here. Y'all know the whole Palestinian-Israel debate. And all the Palestinians over here, they're protest, protesting. Uh, from the river to the sea. From the river to the sea. From the river to the sea. You've heard all that. The river they're talking about is the Euphrates River. It's over by the nation of Israel. And from the river to the sea, they want to wipe Israel off the face of the map. And uh, that's why they said from the river to the sea. Uh, because if you looked on a map right there, Israel, in between the Euphrates River. And, uh, and so you say, why is that significant? Well, this whole thing, tribulation, this whole thing is going to revolve around what country? The nation of Israel. Euphrates River right there. Come up. These angels, these four angels be loosed. They're right there. China, 200 million army. China um, and some others are going to rise up and they're going to head over there just like what they're doing now, trying to wipe them off the face of the map. You say, are they going to succeed? Nope. Because, and I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse. The Calvary's coming. The, Cal <laughs> the Calvary's coming. <laughs> yes. 